The Lord be with you. As you're turning in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, I'd like to tell you about a different book. Um, it's one of the oldest sort of Christian writings we have outside of the New Testament called the Didache. In that book, it outlines how one should baptize, and it recommends having cold, flowing water. I'm sure it was written by a fat man, because still warm water, man, I'm going to be sweating for a while, but you all sweat through with me, okay? We're in Isaiah chapter 53 this morning, beginning with verse 4, and we'll be reading through verse 12 this morning. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning with verse 4. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living." Stricken for the transgression of my people, that made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may we hear what you would have us to hear, or that we may do what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I remember when I was talking to Jeffrey, Jeffrey was six foot something, He played DB at Sanford for a while before he broke his ankles, literally broke his ankles. Jeffrey and I were sitting on the back porch of a little bunkhouse on Quantania Farms there in Americus, Georgia, and we were talking about God, a good subject to talk about with friends. And Jeffrey was telling me how in the last few months he was beginning to transition in his faith away from the African-American Baptist upbringing he had to a more Pentecostal style of worship. I asked Jeffrey about it. I said, the few folks in my family who go to church tend to go to the assembly of God, so there's a lot of hugging and squealing and that sort of thing. What's it like at your church? Jeffrey began as solemn as anything to tell me about how one day he had just felt something And how the pastor had a group of new church members, interested members, come to a room where folks were gathered around to pray for these folks. And I remember he paused. He said, Chris, as real as anything, that pastor came and he put his hand on my stomach and I felt something. He said, I wouldn't have believed it if it wasn't me. I felt it. He said, and all of a sudden it was like this fountain of fire raising up through my chest And out of my mouth, and he said, I began to speak in tongues. Now, I'm still a Baptist, so I still have some questions, I suppose, about such things. But I know Jeffrey. I know this was not some psychosomatic slip. 
That for him, God had revealed God's self to Jeffrey in this way. And I suppose you all know somebody who's had some miraculous thing, maybe even yourself, where God has shown up. God has spoken in some miraculous sign or wonder. I suppose God shows up that way. Any of you Almond Brothers band fans? Anybody? It's okay. It's a, we're a different kind of Baptist. It's okay to admit that. Okay. Well, I, I know, actually, the biggest Almond Brothers band fan. His name is Jim Barnett. He was a university minister at Sanford. I worked in his office. On his um, wallet is a permanent backstage pass that he's kept for a while. And working with him, I had the, the privilege to meet O'Teal Burbridge. He was the bassist for the Almond Brothers for a while. We had lunch, I think, together, Jim, O'Teal, and I. And he was telling me, Jim, about his conversion experience, how God had been working on him. And then one day in the shower, as clear as anything, he heard someone say his name. As clear as anything. Now, O'Teal is not a name you just think you hear. I think I hear people say Chris all the time. Most time they are, but it ain't me. But he said, as clear as anything, I knew it was God. I suppose God speaks that way sometimes. That God shows God's self through these miraculous sort of signs and wonders. Maybe you've seen God that way. Of course, for me, one of the more or sort of often ways God shows God's self is through those sort of humble acts of love and kindness. Like when I was in Texas, pastoring the little Osage Baptist Church, every Saturday, Friday afternoon, I'd come down and clean the place, which usually meant vacuuming the sole strip of carpet down the middle and then rubbing lemon oil on the old pulpit or something. I heard a car door open in the parking lot. I heard another car door, then the other car door, and then the sort of rumble of gravel as someone drove away. Didn't think much about it. Out in that part of Texas, there ain't many places to rendezvous except maybe an old church gravel parking lot. And so I just went on about my business until I went out to my truck, and there in the driver's seat was a copy of the complete stories of Flannery O'Connor. And the inside cover said, From Lanny to Chris, enjoy. Lanny French had been a member of our church in a way, he showed up one Easter and then just showed up every so often. But one day had decided to leave me this copy of a book outside of maybe the Bible that has transformed so much of my life. God speaking not just through the words of Mary Flannery, but through the actions of Lanny. And then there was those times when I was at college. Every day before lunch, we'd go down to the mailboxes, open them up, Find out whatever little senseless dribble somebody had sent you. You know, you could apply for a credit card as a college student. A massive, massive credit limit of $250, those sorts of things. But every, every week, at least once a week, there would be a small little card. And the return address would be Ann Arrington, County Road 606 or 620. Ann was the organist at my home church, as far as I know still is. There was nothing really earth-shattering in those letters. She didn't write to tell me about the latest devotional she had read. Usually it was too much information about a doctor's visit or what her sister Rachel was up to. But once a week, just a little note from Ann. I don't know if I'd have got through if it wasn't for those little notes. Sometimes God shows God's self through humble little acts of love and kindness, but there are those times... There are those times when God shows God's self through the unexpected. My friend Lee likes to tell the story of when she was in seminary. If you go into her office now, it's decorated with frogs, which seems kind of strange for Lee, if I'm honest with you. Uh, but there are frogs everywhere, painted frogs, stuffed frogs, pictures of frogs everywhere. I asked her one time, I said, Lee, what's, what's the deal with the frogs? She said, well... When I was in seminary, I was really conflicted about whether or not to continue on. Lee's in what we call a second career minister. 
She was praying, and one night she opened the door, ready to go outside to wrestle with God over whether or not she would continue on. And there in the doorway, what was it? A frog. But he said, I don't know. It didn't say my name. It didn't speak Koine Greek. Just a frog. But I knew that God was giving me an affirmative answer. God spoke through a frog. Somewhere in the Bible, he speaks through a donkey. The King James says another word, but we've cleaned it up a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes God shows up in unexpected ways. And then sometimes God shows up the way God's supposed to. In big acts of power and might. Everybody knows somebody, right, who has that story. You know, I had an uncle, an aunt, a, a second cousin, three times removed. I still don't even know what that means. Uh, but, you know, they had cancer one day, went to the doctor, had the PET scan. Doc came in and said, I don't know. I've never seen anything like this in my life. But the cancer's gone. We all know somebody, don't we? Sometimes God shows up the way God is supposed to in those great, big, powerful ways. But does God ever show up in weakness? I mean, surely God doesn't show up that way, right? Surely God's not supposed to show up in brokenness, in fault. God doesn't show up that way, right? God is God. There's no way God, the all-powerful, the omnipotent, the, the almighty, shows up in wee little broken things, right? But here, here in this text from Isaiah, we call him second Isaiah sometimes, we have one of his servant songs. And my goodness, my goodness, is this servant broken? But God, God surely doesn't use brokenness and weakness to reveal God's self, right? But then there's Abram. God calls him. We don't know why. We're not told he's special. But God calls him. If you read the story of Abraham, by the way, it's not all really nice church stuff. He's a pretty weak dude. He gets confronted by the Pharaoh, and what does he do? He says, this ain't my wife, this is my sister, you can have her. Women, if you, don't like, if you like Abraham after that, come on. And still, God, go to the land I'll show you. Then there's Moses, not the Charlton Heston Moses, the Bible's Moses. The stu st stuttering murderer, Moses. And yet still, God calls Moses to liberate his people. Or don't even get me started on David. Can we stop calling him a man after God's own heart? I don't like it. My Old Testament prophet in seminary hated it. David, a man who who, let's be honest, assaults a woman and then a married woman and then has her husband put on the front line of the hardest battle to die so he can get away with it scot-free? And let's not talk about all the other stuff he does. But still, can God use that brokenness? Or then there are all the prophets. I like to read the prophets to encourage me about how to speak, but I always try to leave out the part of what happens to the prophets. They usually wind up dead, powerless, it seems, to change the minds of the masses and the mighty. And yet still, God calls them. Even this prophet Isaiah who speaks about this servant. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. We don't really know who he's talking about. Is he talking about himself? Is he talking about Israel? I mean, I know we all want to say he's talking about Jesus, and I believe he is. But what was he talking about for himself? We don't know. But what we do know is that in this song is the servant of God who suffers, who is broken, who is weak. Can God show God's self 
through weakness? Well, the answer is, of course. And I may go so far as to say it may be the most effective way that God shows God's self. For if God can show up with an unwed mother and her middle-aged betrothed in some backwater town called Bethlehem, if God can show up in a mangy, wild-haired man in a camel diaper with a leather belt standing in, in a muddy creek, if God can show up, And some old tax collector sitting there taking people's money, fleecing them for every dime they've got. If God can show up in some old smelly fisherman, if God can show up in some man who is bound and determined to kill them all on the road to Damascus to be struck down. If God can show up in some carpenter's son who stands to say some words about loving God and each other. If God can show up in the lash of a whip, in the ringing of a hammer as it drives the nails into the hands and feet, if God shows up in the words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Can't God show up? If God shows God's self in weakness, who's to say God can't show up for you? If God can show up in bits of bread and a little juice in the water from the Calhoun County Water Authority, if God can show up, who's to say God can't show up with you, through you, for you? And who's to say God can't show up through the ones you think are missing it all? That God can't show up through the weakness of others to speak to you? Who's to say God's not here now speaking to you through your own weakness, through your own brokenness? It's the way we see and hear the witness of God. And we are reminded of that this morning, not only in the waters of baptism, but now as we gather around the table of broken bread and spilled wine, the body and the blood of Christ, broken and shed for you. Let us pray. Eternal God, creator, redeemer, and friend. Lord, we hear the song of the servant. Brokenness, weakness. And Lord, as we look to the cross, we see it there. But Lord, we are reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul, echoing in the background of these words from Isaiah. That your weakness is stronger than the world's strength. So Lord, remind us of your presence as we gather now around the table. As we are served, may we remember your broken body and your shed blood for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.